Yesterday, when we left off, I was talking to Lala um, Conrad about um, her ex life experiences, and we were interrupted uh, with a technicality, and she was just about to tell us that she had been born in the South, and then we lost it. Miracle of modern technology. But she's back. Yay! I'm, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so let us, let us pick up, Lala. Um, thanks for joining me once again. Let's pick up with your words were, which were, I was born in the South. Ah, well, thanks for having me again, David. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, yes, I was born in the South. And I think we were talking about guns. Um, yes. And yes, and how that related to uh, being, being from the South. I was raised around guns. However, I never, uh, my, my father and my uncles were all hunters. And right. so they all used but in my early life, I, I of course didn't hunt, but I I shot trap and ski. Mm. So I was very with shotguns. But when it came to rifles and learning to fire a rifle, uh, I was I was a, sort of at a loss. And being left-handed was was another sort of setback for me uh, when it came to to working uh, working the mechanism of of, of uh, a four fifty eight. So or 375. Can they, can they custom build one of those rifles to, for somebody who shoots left-handed? Well, I should imagine it's very expensive. Well, I think they do, and I think they can. I think they make them, but uh, mm. of course, none of those were available. And as it, as it was, I, I worked out a way to, I, and along with all the other left-handed people, there aren't that many, but there are a few of us here and there. Um, we have a reaching over the top, and um, and it, it it works pretty well. It works pretty well. Well, I suppose for for right-handed people, it, it would it would probably look awkward. But I think left-handers generally get the the thick end of the wedge, so to speak, when it comes to <laughs> anything from scissors to you know. There was a left-handed shop in Johannesburg for a very short period of time. I don't think it was it was well supported. Oh, really? Yeah. And you could buy left-handed scissors and a variety of other um, objects, ho household objects that would normally be used by a right-handed person. Interesting. Well, I, I learned to use scissors with my right hand, but that's pretty much the only thing I do with my right hand. Everything else I do with my left. So, yeah. I, I, I'm right-handed, but when I started playing the guitar, I was playing left-handed for some reason. So the woman said to me, that taught me, said, we'll have to restring the guitar so it works in the, and I went, you know what? I'll play it right-handed. It's easy. <laughs> I don't know why, why I picked it up left-handed. It was just one well, of those things. It just hadn't come out yet. Maybe that's, that's a thing. Yeah. But back in the day when I was born, they were trying to switch children, left-handed yeah. children, switch them. Um, I think I'm a bit older than you are, but when uh, when I went to I've got school, news I... for you, Lala. I think we're the same age. Are we? Yep. <laughs> My birthday in two weeks' time. Is it is it a big birthday? No, I've passed the big birthday already. I'm heading for the for the next big birthday. Oh my! Oh my goodness! Uh, well, you. I'm I'm prom. I will I will be sixty seven on the fifteenth. Oh. Oh my gosh, it must be the lighting. It must be your new light. You look magnificent. <laughs> it's, I would never have known. <laughs> you, as an actress, um, I know with our stage, with our older stage actors, we used a, a, a specific gel color. It was called Surprise Pink, um, but mm. it softened the flesh tones of the elderly men and women on stage and made them look really, really good. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll have to check that out next time I get a job. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking of that, I'm, I'm going to digress for a moment. Because talking about you as an actor, I started watching um, a Netflix series called Schitt's Creek. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've watched it, but there is a, a lady in there, uh, an actress in there, who was an actress. You were talking about slasher movies. And she comes right. back to do a movie called The Crows which is basically a ripoff of Hitchcock's um, The Birds. Ah. It's a terrifyingly bad movie, and she plays sort of the, the lead crow in a really bad outfit. But if you haven't oh. watched 
it, watch it, because I think you will, I don't want to say identify with, but you can empathize with her. Oh, most definitely. I've heard of it. I just haven't had the chance to watch it yet. Well, haven't had the chance. I've been in quarantine now for months, so <laughs> I, <laughs> depending on... No, no, no excuse. But I'm hoping that you sort of marching around your new apartment, tracking things that may be there, you know, putting foot, getting your daughters to put footprints down and then trying to figure out who they belong to, just to keep your eye in. Keep, keep, keep current a little bit. Yeah. That's one of the things that really saddens me about the fact that I, I live so far away right. from the book. Because when I do come home, I'm thrown into a completely urban environment. And so I do, if, if I don't sit down and read every night and, and look at my tracking books and, and listen to my bird calls, I, I start to lose my knowledge. It starts to sort of go to the back of my mind and sort of disappear in a sense. It does come back as soon as I get back there, but it, yeah. there's, there's a transition period on both ends that, that I, I wish I didn't have to go through, but it, you know, it's, is, it's part is of there it. No, is there no wilderness area close to where you live that you could sort of, not now obviously, but before that you could get out into? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my house was right next to Griffith Park. I don't know okay. if you're familiar. No. Los Angeles. A uh, uh, very well-known observatory, the Griffith Observatory, which okay. is right at the huge park and uh, a lot of walking trails and it's a beautiful area to get out and walk your dogs and, and picnic and, and sort of explore. So yeah, I had, I had that uh, at, at my disposal. Didn't use it as much as I probably should have. <laughs> now that I'm gone, I can really appreciate it. <laughs> I, I was about to say, if you, um, if you think back to the camps that, that uh, we've both spent time at, uh, where the wildlife wanders through the camp, you mm -hmm. know, you, uh, here in South Africa, it's a whole different kettle of fish back in the States, I should imagine. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We do have coyotes and we have them out here as well in right. the suburbs. Uh, coyotes and, and of course a lot of skunks and things like that, but no real predators uh, such, as, such as there are there. No, no bears and cougars. <laughs> uh, no, not that I've seen, not that I've experienced. <laughs> that that um, Karongwe camp, uh, on the one trip, I think it was before, uh, just before I met you, um, you arrived a little later that, that particular time. Um, I couldn't get back to my tent because there was a buffalo. I was buffalo. in tent nine and there was a buffalo grazing outside. Cool. And when we went back there with Michael, he said, listen, you're just going to have to wait until it leaves. You can't just walk past it. It's not going to allow you to do that. I remember being told, if you see one, j just turn around. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> you, yeah. You just go and spend yeah, the just, night next to the fire. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a buffalo more than likely. Yeah. They, yeah. they gravitate that camp. Yeah, right they, around where tent nine is. Is it up going toward the the bathrooms? Correct. It's the, just the other side yeah. of the bathrooms. That's that's where they like to be. Yeah. <laughs> And then if you've been to Salati and you haven't seen the elephants wand and the lions wandering through there. Oh, yes. It's been a <laughs> poor well, old Norman I'm, got his, shoe, his Christmas gift eaten by a lioness that took just one and went off into oh, the riverbed and ate it. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> you know how they well, teach I'm, you never leave anything outside your tent? Yes. He'd left the shoes outside the tent and the lions... The, a, a small pride came walking through that Salati pride and decided that this was a good toy. Took it off into yeah. the middle of the river and ate it. <laughs> and ate it. Yeah. Oh. oh, well, I'll have to remember that. I do tend to leave my shoes outside the tent. No, you can't, you can't do that, Lala. Oh, and the other thing, you, we were talking in part one about uh, pride lands. There are hmm. lots of scorpions in pride lands. Lots. So if you get the opportunity, buy yourself a black light before you um, come back or get one from here locally. And then you can find the scorpions because they glow in the dark. Yes, yes. In fact, I have one. I have got one at camp. My first, uh, my first trip, I got right. one. Okay. I got one for our camp out and because I was one of... I don't know why, but one of my fears was that a scorpion would crawl into my sleeping bag during the camp out. So I thought, 
I know I'll get the black light. I'll check around my, my sleeping bag. And as it turned out, there were so many scorpions. I finally <laughs> just said, whatever. <laughs> uh, you, you've just um, made a memory resurface because I'd forgotten it. The really? evening that we had the sleep out in Karongwe, you taken some medication. I did. <laughs> you and Sven. <laughs> oh, oh, do you know, I will forever be embarrassed by that. I am shamed by that night. I just, I, yes, I took, I, <laughs> I took the sleeping tablet because I me. thought, I took a sleeping tablet because I thought, you know, I, I'm going to be up all night. I'm going to do my, 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 um, my, my bit, you know, by the fire, I'll do my hour. And then as soon as that's over, I'm going to take a sleeping tab so that I can actually get a few hours of sleep. Well, I haven't taken a sleeping tablet since then because I, my fiance would kill me. <laughs> and I'm sure most of the people who were there with me wanted that evening ah, oh my but you see we didn't know it was you because Sven was sleeping across the way from me and when he woke me because his snoring was far worse than yours far worse I oh, thought yeah I think problem yeah I, I thought it was sort of two or three o'clock in the morning and I figured you know I can I can get through two hours you know, waking early type of thing and when I looked at my watch it was only 10 o'clock and I thought this is going to be a really, really oh. long night. So I spent most of the night doing astrophotography because I had all my gear with me. So I spent the night photographing the, the, the sky. And you may, or well, you were sleeping, so you might not remember that there were two male leopards on either side of us that evening mm -hmm. to each other. I think they were calling because of you and Sven. They were uncertain yeah. if there was if there were new leopards in the area. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I look at it this way. We may have saved your lives. I mean, they could have they, they overrun the camp. Who knows what could have happened if not for our snoring? You, David, you, can, you can believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> <laughs> for story, I feel like I can't. Oh. Oh, but, but listen, I suppose that's, that's all the fun of those sort of sleep outs. I mean, oh, right. sorry, the the executive assistant is getting ridiculous. So we'll just put the cat <laughs> out, so to speak. <laughs> now I've got he's a he's a long haired cat. So if you oh. grab him, there's fur all over, <laughs> like hair is floating all over the place right now. But he's hopefully will just lie down and play on the floor. He's become. He, he was very insistent this evening for some reason. Um, mm. So what happens now? What is the next step? Um, for those who missed part one, and uh, that's your fault and not ours, um, Lala is a backup trails guide with eco training here in South Africa. She's given up her acting career, although she may be acting for, um, for the, the tourists that she interacts with here and the students. <laughs> we'll never know. Um, so <laughs> where is next for you? I mean, um, uh, level wise. Well, I actually, my, I think when we first spoke, my, my, my idea at that time was that I wanted to be the oldest living trails guide backup. Well, <laughs> I think I've already accomplished that. So right. <laughs> one around. So, um, having reached that goal, uh, I think, I actually think, and this will take me a while, hopefully it will happen before I, I expire, but right. I'm planning to continue as a backup, uh, log as many hours and encounters as possible, and then, and then pursue a lead. Okay, because people don't know that you can't just, every hour that you spend in the bush, you have to log every, pardon me, every walking hour. And right. your encounters are encounters with dangerous game. It's not walking past Impala and ticking that off. That's not an encounter. That's just a, an incident. Correct. Correct. So, so yes, I, I, I will continue to do that as long as they allow me to back up. And hopefully I will, I will log enough hours and enough encounters to, um, to qualify for my lead. 
But, you know, for me, this is something that it's, this is, I don't know how this is gonna sound, but it's one of the things, it's one of the few things in my life that didn't come particularly easily to me. Okay. I, I, I've been, I've led a charmed life. I've been very blessed and very lucky. And so when I began my, my journey to become a trails guide, I, I thought, well, the information will be straightforward. I will absorb it and then move on. There is so much and it's, it's, it makes it all the more fascinating. Every time I walk, I see and learn so much and I realize how much I don't know. Yep. So just, just logging the hours and the amount of encounters needed to qualify is not going to be enough for me. So right. I will be a trails guide backup or apprentice trails guide, um, as they call it now, uh, for quite some time. So I'm not going to go for my lead until I am certain that I am completely competent, completely ready to do it. And, and then that is my next, that's my next plateau. That is what, that's what my dream is. Did you have Bruce Lawson for either trails or ARH? Uh, both. Yes. Both. Because you know, Bruce, bless him. He started, he, he's just done a challenge. It was a 150 kilometers in three days. Um, to mm -hmm. raise money for a charity here in South Africa. But then Bruce, being Bruce, decided that that wasn't enough. And he went on to walk a thousand kilometers in 20 days. But he ended up with, I think it was 74 people in 14 countries doing the mm -hmm. 150k cha challenge for a variety of different um, charities of their choosing. Mm -hmm. which I thought was awesome. I, I'd interviewed him the day after he finished. He could barely stand. Um, oh. his, he was so sore. Oh, I can imagine. He's an amazing person. And I, I tell you, I was totally intimidated by him in the beginning. And he is such a generous, generous uh, person with his knowledge. Yeah. And he's, if you're eager to learn, he is the most wonderful teacher you could possibly have yeah. and such an amazing man. Both he and Dee are, are lovely human beings. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled that he was my ARH assessor, instructor, and also uh, my assessor for trails guide as well. Okay. He and Sean Patrick started uh, walking together, but Sean unfortunately had to fall out for one reason or another, but uh, Bruce carried on. ARH oh. for people who don't know is advanced rifle handling. Uh, we mentioned uh, rifles earlier. What does that consist of? Because, um, and I, I'm, I don't mean to be rude, but you're not the hugest person on the planet. And I can imagine <laughs> that, that that 357 or the 458 is about as big as you are. Uh, well, uh, I'm from Los Angeles, as you know, so yeah. that could never be an insult to me. Telling me I'm small is probably the greatest compliment in the world. I thank you for that. Um, yeah, they're, they're a bit heavy, but you get used to it. I'm building, I'm building some biceps here. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> hand, my gun arm. Um, so yeah, it's something that, you know, it, every time I, I, I come back, it takes a couple of weeks for me to get up to speed with carrying the rifle and walking. Yeah, yeah they are, they are quite heavy and, and it was a bit of a challenge. When I first started just holding the rifle mm. and being shoot and keeping it steady while I was while I was trying to shoot at the targets during the training. So yeah, 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 it, it's a challenge. It is because <laughs> I hadn't shot since 1971. So wow. when I went off to Salati, um, the the ARH that they were doing there was um, Sean was in charge, and he said to me, "Look." Mm -hmm. You haven't shot for such a long time. Why don't you take the tutu and you can shoot with that just to see if you still have an eye? And I right. scored tens. I was stunned, and I don't know who was more stunned, him or him or I. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and then he said to me, "Do you want to shoot?" And I went, "No, I don't want to shoot with big guns. I'm sorry." <laughs> you know, you, you you learn very quickly. You must quit when you're ahead. Absolutely. Oh, and, absolutely. And after yeah. full tens. I thought, 
I can take the target home and brag about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and let's leave it. Let's leave it at that. But do you not have a do you not have a feeling to do one of the specialized knowledge skills, uh, the SKSs, uh, birds or something like that? Well, birds are a challenge for me, and so yes, in fact, I do. Um, I I but I will tell you that if you ask anyone who has instructed me up to this point, and <laughs> you ask. <laughs> what my bird knowledge is, is like, they'll just shake their heads. <laughs> because, I love, the, I love, the, I'm, I'm, I have an affinity for them and I love them, but yeah. they don't want the knowledge of, of the birds just flies right out of my head. Literally. So, literally just <laughs> flies away. So I'm working on that. In fact, when I applied uh, to be a backup, that was one of the one of the things that I that I wrote on my application that I wanted to work on. Yeah. My situation situational awareness, my my um, my uh, birding skills, and also um, trees. <laughs> trees are trees are interesting for a variety of different reasons. I always joke with people who who enjoy trees because I say to them, birds fly, animals run, trees go nowhere. So you can't go ooh ah about a tree if you see it today, because if you walk or drive in the same area tomorrow, that tree's still going to be there. It hasn't gone anywhere else. Right, that's true. But they are fascinating, and the more you learn about them. Some years ago, I did a, I was at a reserve in KwaZulu Natal, and the owner of the reserve took me out, and I realized very quickly that although they had um, lots of elephants, his first love was trees. Really? And we did a three hour drive where we looked at nothing but trees. And I came away from that with a whole new respect for people mm -hmm. who A, know their trees and B, for the trees themselves. Mm -hmm. They're fascinating. Mm -hmm. We think they we're clever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating. And there's, again, there's the more I learn about them, the more I realize I don't know and want to learn. So yeah. my thirst for knowledge is so great in all the areas. I, I still need to find where I, where I can excel and right. you know, in an area I might want to specialize because it will probably be in one of the areas that, that gives me the most trouble, you know, the, be it the, trees. Just don't do what I did. I was Which, asking about um, sickle bush. Uh, in, Marit uh, in Maritaba with a group of students standing in a road and I said to the head guide, do you get sickle bush in this area? And all the students burst out laughing, including the head guide who said, look around you, David, David we're in a sickle bush forest. <laughs> <laughs> so I now never ask. Because I not I didn't know that the sickle bush have the most beautiful flowers. They have a small Chinese, almost a Chinese lantern. lantern. Yes. That are stunning. And so I was looking at those, but I'd I'd never seen them in bloom. I'd only seen it, them without, you know, sort of naked. And when he said to me, You're in the middle of. So from now on, I <laughs> I, li I listen, I don't speak. Specifically if Bruce is around. Or Sean uh -oh. matter because I found out. You see, you you mentioned you mentioned birding and and your your affinity with, but your lack of knowledge of mm -hmm. Bruce. Bruce's dad was was a phenomenal birder. That's where he really? got his love. And I mean, you walk in the bush with Bruce, and something sort of goes, and Bruce knows what it is. Not that exactly he doesn't know what it is. He knows what sex it is, where it came from everything it's whole Every it's whole family history i think he knows what they're saying to one another as well, <laughs> I think he does as well. <laughs> but you know Lala, that that is what i think um, a lot of people lose out on when they come to africa on safari mm -hmm. and i've i've learned and i was talking to i've been speaking to other people about this i've learned not to be judgmental because i used to be of the international tourists who would come out and all they wanted to do is see the big five and then i realized that living in Africa like I do, and in this particular instance with you in LA and I'm here in Johannesburg, just brings that home. You keep saying you want to come back. I'm 
two hours away, if that, from, from a big five reserve here in, in mm. close to Johannesburg. So I learned very quickly, or I realized very quickly, that a lot of the international tourists save up for the longest time. They probably get one opportunity to come and see those five that they've been told about for their entire lives growing up, the stories, the zoos, the Disney movies. And that's what they want to see. But you've brought it home now in as much as there's so much more from the from a dung beetle to a golden orb web spider spinning and you have to walk into the web. Although backup never does. It's always the lead that walks into the spider web. <laughs> Fortunately. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there are there, there there are things that and and Perhaps you can you can um, agree or disagree with me that when people are co come to Africa on safari, try and do a walk because a lot of the lodges will do game drives and then after breakfast they'll say, "Does anybody go want to go for a walk?" And people go, "No, we've been up since four o'clock. We want to go and nap." You can nap when you go home. You can nap when you're dead. Exactly. <laughs> You know, there's so much to see and everything you experience opens another door and yeah. is connected to something else. And then, then you go on that journey and then you can go as deeply as you want to go um, into every aspect of it. And you were talking about dung beetles. Mm. I'm fascinated by them. In fact, at 60 for my birthday, I'm getting a dung beetle tattoo. Are you getting the tattoo? I know, we, I, I remember we discussed this. <laughs> I'm getting it for my birthday. Yes, I am. Have you, so, have you got the designer ready? I do. His name is Kissy Boy Jake at Shamrock Tattoo in Hollywood. Right. And okay. I'm for on my birthday to get my tattoo. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I need to see pictures once it's done. Oh, you bet. Oh, it'll be all over. I'll, I'll <laughs> send them. You'll be the first one to get a, a photo. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is the, I mean, when I came back, um, no, I, I hadn't seen you subsequently. In November last year, uh, my wife and I went off to Placeri Sands, um, which is near Hoodspray. It's near Pridelands. It's not too far from Pridelands. Mm -hmm. And normally when I go into the bush, uh, the field guide always says, what would you like to see? And my answer is always either something dying in front of my lens or a pangolin. And the field guide oh. invariably says, it's easier to find you something to die in front of your lens. But on that particular trip, the first day into the bush, um, when the field guide said to me, what would you like to see? I thought, let me be different. And I said, I'd like to see hyena. Because I hadn't seen them for a while. And lo and behold, what did we find? Pangolin. Hey. <laughs> I saw I your photo. Amazing. I Just... could not. I mean, that's November last year, Lala. I still, I still pinch myself. I look at, I've, I've now got the tattoo on the back of my leg. I came back, I, my wife didn't even argue with me. I said, I'm getting, she said, I know a pangolin tattoo. I went, yes, <laughs> as one does when you, when you wait 53 years to see an animal and then get to spend an hour and a half with it. They left me in a tracker. Oh. What an amazing experience. Yeah, what? The, the guide was, was awesome. There were two Americans on the vehicle with us. And um, they'd called in Buffalo after we got to the pangolin. And mm -hmm. uh, Nerese said to me, look, I know you want to stay. You've seen Buffalo before. The other guests haven't. I'll leave you in the tracker and we'll go to the Buffalo. And they left and the tracker and I sat for 90, for 90 minutes with that animal. It was oh awesome. It's something I'll never forget. Never forget. Oh, no, that will stay with you forever. What an amazing, yeah. amazing experience. I can't Have, imagine this. But, but listen, this talk is not about me. This is about you. So I want to know what exciting encounters you had while you've been out here. Well, I'll tell you something. I, I was out with Steve Bailey one day when I was backing up at, at Salati. And we came upon a, a group of cheetah, a mother and four cubs. And we got down on our bellies and leopard crawled to within 
I would say we left our packs and our rifles and everything behind us and just crawled on the ground so close to these leopards. When we got too close, the mother would hiss at us, we mm -hmm. would stop. But the group of us, the students and all of us got within, I would say, four meters. Yeah. Yeah. That would be and, my guess. And that's such a such a special experience in the north of Karongwe, because Eco Training's um, Karongwe camp is in the south. But if you go mm -hmm. up north, they've got cheetah there. And we did a very similar thing. We walked to within five meters. Mm -hmm. And then you just you just stand and you don't say a word. Um, mm -hmm. And and they they go about cheetah business. They don't even care about you. And they're not habituated. I mean, they're not tame cheetah. They wild cheetah, but they just accept you into their space. Yes, it, it was a, it was an amazing experience to see how they reacted to us at different moments, at different times, depending mm. on our position and what they were doing. And and at one point they just, you know, they got up and moved, and then they came back, and then we, you know, at one point Steve said, "Okay, we've we've been here long enough. It's time to yeah. we backed up and 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 left them." But it was it was one of the most fascinating things I've ever ever seen. But now, when you go back to to La La Land, so to mm. speak, and you tell your girlfriends, uh, "This is what we did," can they can they envision you crawling through the African dust to get close to cheetahs just to go ooh ah? <laughs> I think I think they get it to a point, mm -hmm. but usually I'm. It's it's interesting because I when I describe my experience, it's it's more about the smaller things, and so they're kind of like, okay, great, wonderful. Well, well, did you see any? Did you see any leopards? Did you you know what did you see? How many elephants? I don't know how many elephants I saw. I got very close to a lot of elephants, and they're fascinating. And they're wonderful. And they're beautiful. But let me tell you how many species of dung beetle there are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see, it goes back to perceptions. But also, I, I was talking um, to to somebody yesterday. Uh, who does guiding, and he's been doing it for 20 odd years now. And I was saying that it seems like zebra and giraffe have inserted themselves into the big five, literally and figuratively. And hmm. international tourists, specifically those from the East, are fascinated with them. I've been on vehicles where guests would rather watch giraffe and zebra than go hmm. and see lions for a second time. Oh, I can understand that. I can. I'm fascinated by them too, especially the zebra um, or zebra, as you call them. We had a whole discussion. You say about zebra, it. we say zebra. You say tomato, <laughs> we say tomato. In fact, where you were sitting yesterday, you've you've changed your position. In now we're seeing a different part. There's a bit of a zen um, area behind you. Not yeah. This I'm sitting at my desk actually this time. Ah, so. okay. Because and my over here so yeah it's a, it's a different a different perspective mm. this, we have to track where where lala is in her apartment um, right. because because <laughs> on, yesterday, safari. On, on safari in lala's apartment there you go uh, back up trails guard 101 where is lala yeah. <laughs> where is lala because you had a there was a giraffe on your wall yesterday yes there yes. it is still there yeah. It's still there. Yeah. It's a girl. Her name is Fanny. I also have uh I also have one on my floor whose name is Wendell. So, you know, I <laughs> I you know, I have my little menagerie. Vera, did, did you bring you you for some reason visitors to Africa tend to love those carved wooden giraffes that you can buy at all the markets. Hmm. And you can always see them on the plane because they get them wrapped. And I mean a giraffe wrapped looks like a giraffe wrapped. You can't pretend it's anything else. <laughs> this is my toothbrush. I don't know what you're talking about. What? Ex exactly. I, I remember years ago with an ex-girlfriend going to visit her family in the States. And um, her sister had asked us to bring one of those giraffes with. And when we got to the airport, of course, customs 
how much is this? And before my girlfriend could answer, because I knew she would, would go into great depth and detail about it, I went, $5. And he went, fine, off you go. <laughs> Never oh, queried. That's it, no worries. Yeah, the, <laughs> and Bob often said, but it's more than, I said, she, she, wait, you can talk to me when we get out of this building. The, the walls have ears. <laughs> <laughs> Homeland Security forcing us to the ground and confiscating our, our, um, our giraffe had visions <laughs> of. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I actually did not, uh, did not bring home any carved anything. I brought home pillows. I have, oh. I have throw pillows. So I brought home tons of pillow covers and table runners. So I don't know, you know, to each of them. <laughs> <laughs> You get on well with my wife. She goes out and buys pillows constantly. For what? I have no idea. We don't have the space well, for this. You're, you're a man. There's, there's an art to placing pillows. You have to have many throw pillows. It's, it's, it's a woman thing. You can't possibly understand it. You know, it's... It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's one of those things. <laughs> like every time she says to me, why do you need another camera? Or why do you need another lens? I say, how many handbags have you got? And that's where the oh. conversation ends. And, yes. <laughs> totally get it. Totally get yeah. it with my fiance tools. It's throw pillows and tools. Yeah. Uh, uh, see, see, tools are, tools I can understand. Yeah, Tim the course. tool man Taylor, they built a whole series around him. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> to each his own, Lala. When you buy your your when you start buying rifles and stuff like that. Then your fiance will understand. Then he'll get it. Then he yeah. will get it. And we went shopping. We went shopping for uh, for uh, three seventy five. But I can't. I can't really find one that I, that I like. I'm going to try and figure out a way to to get one of my own at some point. But so far, the camp the camp uh, uh, rifles have been have been fantastic. So I, I haven't had one. Yeah, absolutely. You can always you can always sort of made us make a snide comment to your fiance that he can always go back to being a barman on a TV series if he's really if he doesn't want to go to the bush with you. That's true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> he can if he wants to talk about how soft the beds are. <laughs> he can go back to that. You can you can you you should start off when you come back and you bring him back. Hopefully he will he will. Um, eventually say, yes, he'll come back to Africa with you. And then you take him to Salati and you let him sleep on a mattress on the floor of a tent with no bed at all. Yes, yes. That's, that's the thing. I, he can't go to Makaleke first. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. Makaleke is only if he's a very good boy and he very behaves himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he listens to you on the walk. <laughs> but... You know, you, you were, we were talking sort of bush experiences and Makuleki, which is a beautiful, beautiful, the northern area of Kruger Park, stunning baobab trees, um, fever tree forests, nice herds oh. of elephant, buffalo. But when I was there, the tent that I was in, nobody told me, was inundated with tiny red ants. Oh. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I was covered from head to foot. The entire bed was alive with those little buggers. It was mm. not a pleasant three nights, I have to tell you. I went through, they, they didn't want to give me like doom. I used oven cleaner, um, liquid, like a liquid spray. So it was oh. water um, rather than, than an insecticide. But mm -hmm. I had three really terrifying nights. And then the two students who were living in the tent said to me, we moved just before you came. So that we could have a good tent, and we gave you that one. <laughs> oh, the rascals! Indeed oh. they were. Indeed they were. I don't think they qualified that particular time. I think I had a word with the with the instructors and said, oh. Boy. <laughs> "No, I didn't. I have no. I have no sway at all. I was only doing content for eco training at the time." Uh. Um, but now, I mean, the next question is, when do you come back? But you don't know because you don't know when. Internet, although lockdown, you know, um, here, and we specifically haven't touched on, on the lockdown, but I see it went to our, const our high court yesterday, 
and levels, uh, the current level is deemed to be against the constitution. And uh, supposedly oh. things, things are meant to change, but it still doesn't open our borders. Um, it doesn't right. allow travel because as we speak, I shouldn't be sitting here. I should have been in Medikwe um, at three camps there for the week. But they also, they're, they're in lockdown and there was no way that I could get to them, unfortunately. Yes. But it gives oh. me the opportunity to talk to you, not once, twice, which is really I know. Cool. <laughs> the part thing, this is fantastic. So, so <laughs> have, have you sort of made plans, or, you know, is it, would you be able to literally, if you get a phone call today, you'll be able to be on a plane tomorrow type of thing? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm packed, I'm ready. Uh, all I have to do is just book my flight and I'm ready to go. And, and so hopefully, you know, things will, will change soon mm. and I'll do that. So I'm, I'm on standby. <laughs> so we shall see. I'm on now, bush standby. Do you have any words of, of wisdom or words of advice? Yes, in, in part one, we discussed pivoting and how you changed your career totally mm. from where you were, not only your career, but your lifestyle and everything that made Lala Conrad who she was pre the backup trails guy that you are now. So mm -hmm. you've changed totally. And so do you have any words of wisdom for women who may be in similar positions to you, who are thinking, what can I do? And understand that the audience for, for this little um, chat that we are having is both in South Africa, hopefully, and in America. So you're talking to a vast audience. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that, that I learned and I share with my daughters on a regular basis, I keep pounding it into their minds, is never believe what other people say about you. Other people's opinion of you is none of your business. Yeah. It doesn't define you. It doesn't mean anything. Get their voices, the voices of others, out of your head completely. I was told who I was. I was told what I could do. I was told what I was capable of from the time I can, my earliest memory, from the time I can remember anything. I was always told, this is what you're good at. This is what you're capable of. This is what you should do with that. And somehow there was a part of me that listened, but didn't actually believe that that was the end all be all. And that is what has saved me. So I would say my words of advice to, to women everywhere, to people everywhere, is don't be defined by the voices in your head that usually come from external sources. You know, turn that voice off and listen and be quiet and listen to the possibilities think think outside the box think outside the head yeah you know that think would like be there is no box basically exactly yeah. all things are possible no matter how dire the circumstances may be change your perception change your life you know, you know i i read this to to a fellow that i interviewed just uh, a few days ago um he says where is it and i carry this with me in my wallet and i have for probably 20 odd years. Um, it's by somebody called Guillaume Apollinaire. I'd never heard of this person before or since, mm. but I'll share this with you because I think it taps into exactly what you've just been saying. It says, come to the edge, he said. We can't master, we're scared. Come to the edge, he said. We can't master, we are scared. Come to the edge, he said. They came. He pushed them. They flew. Freedom is our destiny, yet we fear taking the very step which will carry us into the greatness which is our own true nature. Oh, that's beautiful. That brings tears to my eyes, David. It's I, lovely. I normally my, can't get through this without crying. Um, no, I've been practicing. I, <laughs> it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. And if we think of our fear, as as the threshold instead of a barrier yeah think of it not as as something to block us 
but as something to move through, to accept, accept our fear yeah. and move through it as, as, as if it's a threshold, then there is no limit. There is no limit to what we can achieve. Lala, that was... <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a copy. Please. I, w I will do. I'll scan it and send it through to you. Lala, thank you so much for not one, but two wonderful interviews. Um, I will release them back to back so that people have got part one on day one and part two on day two, and they can follow, follow you. If, if people want to find out more about you, um, are you, do you have a social media presence? Can they sort of follow Lala in Africa or, or your career and find out more about you? I actually don't have a website, but I am on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. Okay. Um, on Instagram, I am just Lavelda in all lowercase letters. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> all over. Uh, and then I'm on Instagram as, I mean, I'm on uh, Facebook as Facebook. Lavelda Conrad. L A V E L D A. Yes, and they can, correct. They can find you there. Or if you, when you're next in Africa, who knows, you may well be their, their backup trails guide. I, I very well may be. Oh, fingers crossed. <laughs> Hope to see you in Africa soon. My guest this evening, part two of uh, Lavelda Conrad in conversation with Lala. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you, David. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.